Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to learn more about you. We ask and plead for your spirit now. As we look and we survey our church, we see that we are in a Laodicean condition. We're lukewarm. We're not hot. We're not cold. And so I pray that you change us. You start with me. Start with my brothers and my sisters in this room. I pray that you'll give us wisdom and discernment as we study and open our Bibles, as we look at the next topic of how to keep people in the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, by the way, whoever is doing the microphone, there's a, a pretty annoying echo, so if you can take away that echo, that would be much appreciated. All right, everyone, welcome to the section of youth-led evangelism. If you have been here, if you have missed the last four presentations, um, man, you've missed some good stuff. We've learned a lot together, but it's okay. Uh, we have our good friends here who have recorded those, so you can go ahead and get the recording. The topic that we'll be looking at today, this one is going to be a shorter topic, and then the final one will be the longer topic. So we're going to go shorter first, take a short break, and then we're going to get into the final topic. The first topic that we're going to get into is how to keep people in the church. Okay. Once you do an evangelistic series, once you do a youth-led project, then how do you keep them in the church? And the final one is going to be uh, the greatest lie ever told. It's going to be talking about how we can finish the work and what is the message that we need to preach. So you don't need to worry about this now. I can actually turn this down. Okay, so here in the Philippines, I praise the Lord that you guys here are known for your evangelism. Many of you here do evangelistic series, and you have tons of people who give their life to God, right? You heard of It Is Written, you've heard Amazing Facts, you heard of U United States evangelists. They come to the U.S. and they hold big evangelistic series at different provinces, with, at different barangays or provinces, all throughout Mindanao and the Visayas and, and here in Luzon. And we see that sometimes thousands of people give their life to God and we look in the magazines and we see all of these people who are getting baptized in the river, right? You've seen that, you've seen pictures of that, you've heard of all those things. But let me ask you a question. How many of those people who are baptized do you think are still Seventh-day Adventists one year later? What do you think? Only a few. Why is that? Why is it, Eris Dave, do you have any answers for that? Why is it that only a few? Jam, why is it only a few stay in the church? They're not nurtured, okay? That's good. I love that answer. How about you, Henry? Any ideas? Why is it not only in the Philippines, but in Africa as well? You know that too. In Africa, we have big evangelistic series, but next year you come back and you look, where are the people who are baptized? And you don't see them. In Filipino, what is it? Voila? Is that what it is? There's no more, right? There's, they're not there. You look at the churches and, and people who you baptize and they have totally left the church. And Jem said one of the key things, one of the reasons why people are not in the church is they are not what? What word did you just say? Nurtured. Now, we have to talk about what nurturing means because anyone can say they're not nurtured, but we have to give practical steps. How then do we nurture people, right? Because anyone can say that. Now. Usually I have Ronald here, and Ronald get, does really good notes, but he's not here. Does anyone here have good handwriting that they can take some notes for me on the board? Because I need a couple of things written down. Edwin, do you have good handwriting? Okay, all right, Edwin's going to do it. I'm going to need some of, you, of uh, your participation. There's markers right there already. And we are going to be looking at what are some methods to keep people. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up, for those of you who heard my testimony, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, but I wasn't really a Seventh-day Adventist. Do you know what I mean? You follow me? 
It's like Adventist in name only. That's it. I didn't know anything about Adventism. I didn't know who Doug Batchelor was. I didn't know what Amazing Facts was. I didn't know the Three Angels message. And did you know that I actually believed that when you die, your spirit or soul goes to heaven? That's how bad I was. I thought you had a soul that goes up to God. You know, that's like the most fundamentally, fundamentally wrong thing that you can think of. That's, you, you just read Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and it says, The dead know not anything, right? So that's the kind of Adventist I was. And I just thought to myself, I don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I thought Seventhists were ugly. I thought, you know, what is that in Tagalog? Bangit, right? I thought they were ugly. Or they were poor. Or they were not smart. They were dumb. Well, how do you say that in Tagalog? Popo? Popo? Is that what you said? Popo. Oh, okay. But I just thought you were, you know, if someone didn't know if you had nothing going on in your life, so if someone was attractive, if they were beautiful, boogie, right? If they look good, they're not going to give their life to God. You know, that they're too good looking for that. If they're smart, they're not going to give their life to God. They're going to, you know, be a professor, be a doctor, do something special with their life. And I thought that, okay, if someone is has a lot going for them or they have a lot of money for themselves, why would they waste their time in the church? Why would you do that? That was my thoughts. And so, you know, early on, I would get good grades. You know, I had a lot of things going on for me. I got into a very, very top internship in the United States of America. And I said, why in the world would I want to waste my life for God? That's what I thought. And I didn't see the purpose of following God. Well. Many of you heard the testimony, but basically God put a series of events in my life where I had to lose everything. I had to all lose the girl that I was dating. I had to lose my, almost lose my job. My car got stolen. I had all these things taken away from me. And that's when I was basically had a Job experience. And that's when I thought to myself, hmm, getting a beautiful girlfriend doesn't make me happy. Getting an expensive car doesn't make me happy. Money doesn't make me happy. Nothing makes me happy. Then I lose everything. I'm still not happy. How do I get happiness in life? And that's when through a miraculous turn of events, someone did Bible studies with me. I was basically as, as dumb as someone who had never read the Bible. They would say, hey, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. Where, where's that? You know? They'd say, you know, turn in your Bibles to Hezekiah or something. And I'm like, okay. I didn't know that Hezekiah is not a book in the Bible, right? That's how dumb I was. I didn't know the books of the Bible. So with that being said, I thought, you know, was Hebrews in the, Hebrews is in the Old Testament, right? I mean, that's really what, what it was. I didn't have an experience. Finally, I gave my heart to God. And because I gave my heart to God, I then started living my life for God. And then Ephesians 5 verse 16 says, to, you can redeem the time. We talked about this. Then I said, okay, the devil got 20 years of my life. How many years? 20 years of my life. I said, I'm going to pay the devil back and give everything I can to God. So then I started doing all these ministries. We started, uh, my friends and I started different ministries. We started ministries similar to GYC. We had a ministries going on that had to do with, you know, online broadcasting. Has any of you ever heard of Audioverse? My friend was the one who came up with that. So if you look on there, those are my friends. They came up with that, and they're basically like, hey, you know, we want to do something to get the Three Angels message out. Even if we can't be there, what can we do to get the messages out? So they came up with Audioverse. My best friend, he was my best man at my wedding, Shane Latham, he came up with the name Audioverse. So these are the type of ministries we started making up. We were not supported by the conference. The conference thought that we were crazy. And I worked 2002, 2003, 2004, I was doing consulting work, but every minute spare time I had, I was winning souls to God. 
Finally, after winning souls to God and doing all these evangelistic series and evangelism, we would have, you know, in the United States of America, an evangelistic series, and we'd have 15 baptisms, 20 baptisms, 30 baptisms. And in the United States of America, evangelism is not like here. It's hard. We would even try to pay people to come to our meetings. We're like, hey, you know, if you come to our meetings, we'll give you da 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 da. We'll, we have, we would give free iPods. I would give a free computer at my meetings. It's like if you come to my evangelistic series meeting, and if you bring the most people, I'll give you a laptop. You know, and it just we tried everything we could think of, and all these different things, and finally we realized the the, the only way and the best way was prayer. And we prayed our hearts out like crazy, and that's when God brought the people. And after all these things, and after starting all these ministries, that's when, and I had no business of joining the church, you know, or being employed by the church. I was happy being a, in business, I was happy having money, and I was happy just doing everything I could in my spare time for God. When people started to take note of the different ministries that I was involved in, one day at someone... He was an employee of the Pacific Union. He says, Michael, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, what does he want to talk to me about? Maybe he wants to talk to me about some theology. And so I was hesitant. And I said, well, what do you want to talk about? I mean, do I need to study my Bible for something before we sit down? And he said, no, 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 no. It's nothing wrong. It's nothing bad. I just want to sit down and talk to you. I said, okay. So he comes to my house. And he comes to my house, and we're talking, and he says, look, I don't know how to say this, but we want to offer you a position. Me? I don't have a theology degree. I've never taken a theology class. I don't, I've never taken a hermeneutics class. I don't know about Hebrew and Greek or anything else, and you want to offer me a position to work for the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yeah, we want to offer you a position. Okay. We want to hire you as the business manager and the director of evangelism for the Pacific Union Conference, Souls West School of Evangelism. And I was like, really? <laughs> I've never canvassed before. I've never done this. I've never taken, you know, my initial uh, thoughts were for you guys would be, I've never taken a single class of theology. Never, not one. And you want to hire me? I graduated with business. We want to hire you. I prayed about it for many months, and God opened the door. And so I realized to myself, I want you to listen to this, especially for those of you who want to work for the SDA church one day, or want to be employed by the conference. The way that you need to live your life is not be a theology major and expect to be hired by the church. I want you to listen to that. What you need to do is you need to live your life as if Jesus is coming tomorrow and not be worried about the church. And you need to do everything to win souls to his kingdom. And if you do that, if you don't even think about if I'm going to be hired, if I'm going to have a church, and you go out and do soul winning on your own, the conference is going to take notice of you. And they're going to say, wow, I want that guy. We want to offer him a job. We want him to be part of us. That's what I want to see. Because so many people I meet, especially here in the Philippines, people become theology majors just so they can work and get a job when they graduate. You honestly shouldn't be expecting a job when you graduate. You shouldn't. You should be taking theology because you want to see souls want to the kingdom. And the moment I see people who are taking theology or ministry or something else, and they want a job afterwards, I tell them, you're taking the wrong degree. You need to be something else. Because what I want to see are future pastors in this church who are going to work nonstop at soul winning, whether they're being paid or not. And if you're willing to work 
for souls without being paid, someone's going to take notice and someone's going to pay you. Because God will take care of you. Okay? So after now being hired, and now I'm the current director of evangelism for Souls West, it's in the Pacific Union, now we do evangelism all throughout in different places. We send young people and teens to do evangelistic series. We teach them how to preach. We teach them how to do Bible work. What we do is we're able to go to a place and we'll canvas and cold port the entire area, almost every single door, for two or three weeks, a whole city. Then after that, we'll follow up with all the Bible studies. Now, why is it important to canvas an area, to cold port it? You see, the books is an excellent way to get in the house. Let me tell you what. Let me show you how. If I knock on your door, Henry, and you open the door, and you say, Hi, how's it going? And I say, Hi, my name is Michael. You go, okay, what do you want? Well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I want to know if you want Bible studies. How successful do you think I'll be in getting a Bible study, doing it that way? They'll think I'm crazy. They'll be like, I don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm, I'm a Catholic. My mom's Catholic. My grandma's Catholic. My great grandma's Catholic. We're all Catholic. We don't want to be. We don't want to change religion. That's what will happen. Now, canvassing an area, Ellen White talks about. If you've never read Cole Porter Ministry, I want you to read it. It works like this. This right here, imagine, is a great controversy. Opens the, opens the door. Hi, my name is Michael. And we're doing something positive for the community, and we're just letting you take a look at this book. He takes a look at the book. I don't talk about religion, nothing else. And I say, hey, I'm actually a student trying to earn my way to school, and we're just leaving it with you, and you just help us out with a small donation. Usually people help us out with anywhere from 10 to $15, or whatever the going rate here in the Philippines is. You just help us out with that, and that actually helps me go to school. And you get to keep the book. So. He gives me money, he takes the book, the book sits there. Now, again, why do we do canvassing work? What if I just gave him this book? I knocked on the door, and I have, you know, I'm from the U.S., so in the U.S. we buy tons of great controversies. These are basically free. They're worth, they're, you know, you can buy them for $1.50 to $2 in the U.S. And what if I just give it to him? Here, I have something for you. Bye. What do you think, do you think he'll read it? No. Why do you think he'll have a greater chance of reading it if he buys it? Because he has paid something. Every time he sees that book on the table, man, I paid for that. I better read it. I better at least look at it. I better at least maybe read the back. You know, like, there's some guilt in him that he bought that book, he gave someone money, and he needs to go ahead and look at it. So next thing you know, he reads the book, okay? So imagine I canvas an area, all these people are reading Great Controversy, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, all these different books, and now I go around, and this time I'm going around to get Bible studies. This time I'm going around as Bible worker teams. Henry has just read the Great Controversy. Hi, my name is Frank, and just want to let you know we're doing a revelation seminar in your area, and we're going to be talking about prophecy. Because Henry read the great controversy, what's he going to think in his mind? Oh, you're going to talk about prophecy? I just read this book, and it talks about prophecy. But some of the things I didn't fully understand. But again, we're just doing a prophecy event. It's free. You can come, bring all your friends. I even have free meals for you to come. Will you come? Right. That's how you do it. The reason why you have, think, think of for a second, for a minute, for, you know, you have the Army or the Navy. Now, when the United States of America goes to a war in another country, they have different branches of the military. The four branches of the main military is, number one, you have the Marines. The Marines are the first one who come in and they clear the area. Then you have the Navy, and they handle the sea area. Then you have what's called the Army. The Army goes in, 
and they actually are the ones to, you know, shoot people, basically, once they're there. Then you'll have the Air Force, and the Air Force goes up, and they take out any targets that you might see. So you have four different branches of military, and every time the United States launches a preemptive strike, they go with the Marines first to clear the area. The canvassing work, or being a coal porter, is that means. It's clearing the area. It's, it's making it receptive. Do you understand? Then after that, you send your army. Your army is your, what do you think? Bubble workers. That's correct. Then you have the Air Force. The Air Force that we have is Audioverse, 3ABN, HCBN. The areas basically we're, we're launching it from far away, in a sense. Are you guys seeing the different tactics that we have? Then you have, you know, what's called your, what's called you have your Navy. And the Navy that I look at it is our medical ministry work. If you have, if you have the reason why the United States of America won World War II is because they had control of the seas. The reason why the Adventist church is supposed to be so influential is because we're supposed to have control of the hospitals. We're supposed to be the number one entity when it comes to medical ministry. And so the most important work, Ellen White talks about this, is the medical ministry work. The most important arm of the, of the branch of the military is the Navy in the United States. If you champion the seas, how are you going to get, how is that country going to get anything shipped to them? How is anything going to come to that, that country? Nothing. It's going to be a matter of time before they basically will die. If we own the hospitals, people need to come to us. People need to come to us for care. So those are the different branches of the military and the different branches we have in God's army. You guys see those things, okay? So that's the reason why we have the canvassing work. Now, we've done the canvassing work, we do Bible work, we do an evangelistic series. Finally, we have baptisms, okay? After we have baptisms, let's just say that, to, to make it easy, 20 people gave their heart to God and are deciding to be baptisms. I want you to listen to these next things. These are the three steps that you need to keep them in the church. So get ready to write this down. Methods to keep people in the church. Three methods. Here's the first method. For the 20 people who have just gotten baptized, this is what you need to do. Whether you're a nurse, whether you're an accountant, whether you're whatever it is, you are still part of a local church. So you need to be able to tell your local church, hey guys, we just had an evangelistic series. People are now converted. Here is what we need to do to keep them in the church. Okay? The first thing. Here is the first thing. You need to assign people in your church to be their mentors. Did you get that? You have to assign people in the church to be their mentors. Okay? What do I mean by that? In a church, you usually have elders, deacons, deaconesses, whatever you have, you have ushers, you have different people in the church. If all of us here, let's just say Henry, Ryan, what's your name, brother? Adrian. Adrian, we are all, let's just say, the elders or the deacons of the church. And right here, we just have new baptisms. What we need to say is, okay, Ryan, when it comes to these two people, what are, what's your name? Genia. Okay. Genia and your name? Judah? Okay, Genia and Judah. You, and they don't know this. This is unbeknown to them. Ryan, your job is to mentor Genia and Judah basically for the next year, this one year. If you ever see them by themselves in potluck, you need to talk to them. If you ever see that they don't have a place to go, you need to offer your place. You need to, if they have no ride, you need to give them a ride. Whatever they need, let's just say that they're stranded somewhere, you need to take care of that. The church will help you out, but you need to do that. Can you do that? All right. That's what you need to do. The church isn't impl imp implementing this step. And that step is to have mentors watch over those two people. 
Then for the next two people, I go to Henry and I say, Henry, you have two people you need to watch. You need to make sure if you ever see them by themselves in potluck, you ditch what you're doing and you go to them. No matter what, you go to them. If they are in trouble, if they need a ride, whatever it is, for the first year, at least for the first year, you are in charge of helping them. Can you do that? Okay? Are you guys seeing this? This process of accountability of helping someone. Now, along with assigning mentors, here's a sub point. I like to call this the rule of seven. So within the, we're going to be talking about, within the first seven months, there's going to be some important things. You need to have, in the first seven months, at least seven people need to invite the new converts to their house. Could be to their house, could be to you know, a dinner, it could be going out, whatever it is. They don't even have to accept it, but at least you have, not only do they have mentors, but I tell my church and I tell my elders and I tell my deacons, I say, hey look, I need you to invite them at least once during seven months. I need you, Jam, to invite any of the new baptisms one time in seven months. Invite them to the park, invite them to play basketball, invite them to do something. You are in charge of at least one time interacting with them, making them feel like family. Does this make sense? You are going out of your way. If I'm the, if I'm the senior pastor of a church, I am telling my church people, and I'm saying, look, these are our new...